Good afternoon, and welcome to today's edition of The World Today. I'm Marie Harf, Executive Director here at Perry World House. We're so excited to have all of you here with us in person and also, of course, to our online audience as well. Today's discussion will revolve around the contemporary radical right movement. These so-called nationalist or populist movements have gained power as a phenomenon spanning the globe, really, in every uh, region of the world, and affecting governments and people in a variety of ways. Even though it's not an entirely unified movement across countries and societies, it does, in general, seek to mobilize alliances against what it portrays as a common enemy, global elites accused of undermining national sovereignty, traditional values, and cultures. In this year of the election, when more voters than ever before in history will head to the polls, again, across the globe, what should we expect from right-wing movements in 2024? There's a lot to discuss there. To answer this question and many more, we have with us three distinguished guests visiting from the University of, Ont uh, of Ottawa, excuse me, uh, all contributors, contributors to World of the Right, Radical Conservatism and Global Order to be published later this year. Our first panelist is Rita Abrahamson, professor in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. She's the author of Security Beyond the State, Private Security and International Politics with Michael C. Williams, and Disciplining Democracy, Development Discourse and Good Governance in Africa. Michael C. Williams is the University Research Chair in Global Political Thought in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, also at the University of Ottawa. His research interests are in international relations theory, security studies, and political thought. Last but not least, Surgeon Vucetic is also a professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. You see a pattern here. His research interests lie in international security, and his books include The Anglosphere, A Genealogy of a Racialized Identity in International Relations, and Greatness and Decline, National Identity and British Foreign Policy. To moderate the conversation, we have with us today Sam Adler-Bell, a writer in New York City. He co-hosts the Know Your Enemy podcast, uh, which is about the American right. His work has appeared in the New York Times, The New Republic, New York Magazine, and Dissent. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Okay, I'm up first. Okay, wow, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm so excited that you all are here for this, um, to talk about this excellent book, um, The World of the Right, Radical Conservatism and the Global Order. I just wanted to start by praising this book a little bit because I don't want to preempt um, the other panelists are gonna describe what's in it. Um, but I read a lot of books about the right. That's what my, my job is, really, for the podcast. Um, and uh, this one is extraordinarily clear. Uh, it's both analy analytically and stylistically clear, which you don't usually get together. You maybe get one or the other. This book is um, a great read, and it's rich. Um, and it was a great relief to me um, that it was so good. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's especially remarkable given that I, if I'm not mistaken, there are 13 or 14 authors on the book, <laughs> all, all from Ottawa. Um, and I, um, I also want to say uh, that it's really humbling for me to be in the company of such serious scholars and careful thinkers, of which I am, unfortunately, I apologize, decidedly not. Um, I, I, I play someone who knows things uh, for the internet uh, every once in a while, but I, I am not a serious scholar. Um, and so for me, what I do relies on very serious scholarship um, like you can read in this book and that you'll hopefully hear on the panel. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Sam, and thanks to you for being here. I've long been an admirer of the Know Your Enemy podcast. I think it's a remarkable uh, achievement and contribution. Thank you. Um, 
Thanks to everyone for being here. Thanks to Perry World House. Thanks particularly to Professor Bob Vitalis of the Politics Department here at Penn, uh, who was really instrumental in, in putting this event together for us. We'll be very, very brief. All we'll try to do is sketch out the main themes of this book, and hopefully everything else can come through, uh, both in the discussion and in the question and answer period. The, the goal of this book is very simple. It's to take what is usually considered to be a domestic or a nationalist phenomenon, the radical right, which is almost by definition nationalist in its focus, and ask to what extent is it a global phenomenon. One of the things that we see are, phenom are parties, movements, actors identifying themselves on the radical right popping up all over the world. Is this simply a coincidence? Is it a conspiracy? Is it something more complicated than either of those two? And we try to explain that the contemporary right is nationalist, it is local, but it is also global, and it is global both conceptually and organizationally. To do this, we try to get over three basic what we think are prejudices about the right, and they're prejudices that are particularly common in the world of, of academe. The first is that somehow this is all just a matter of technology. This is the internet, right? It's the digital age, it's all that kind of stuff. Undoubtedly, but that's not enough. The second is that this is all just economic. This is, as we call them, the left behinds, right? The narrative of the great unwashed out there who are rising up against their overlords in some kind of replay of medieval pitchfork and, and torch-bearing stuff. Also important, we think also not true. The third prejudice we have to get over is, and this is the one that is most common in the, in the university, unfortunately, is that the right is stupid, right? That these are basically a bunch of knuckle draggers wandering around doing terrible things. The problem with that is that while all three of those elements capture certain things about the contemporary right, they actually don't capture a lot of what is going on, which we think is much more complicated, and indeed at one level is much more sophisticated. We're trying not to over-sophisticate these people, but we're trying not to under-sophisticate them either. And what we try to trace in the book is how what we call the world of the right is the outcome of an ideological political project that is much more deep and long-standing than we see in the contemporary world. It's a project that's been going on for about 50 years now. We try to trace it through a figure that you probably wouldn't expect. That is, a long-dead Italian Marxist by the name of Antonio Gramsci. For those of you who remember your Gramsci from your undergraduate or graduate days or just from the popular media because he pops up, Gramsci's idea was that Political power was never simply a matter of coercion. It was always a combination of coercion and consent. And that in this process of, of the production of consent, culture was vital. Thus, any hegemonic order relied upon an understanding of the world that had become naturalized. And what was crucial, for, therefore, for any counter-hegemonic order was to understand the nature of its enemy, not to steal a term that may have been trademarked across this stage, mm -hmm. but also that could create a counter-hegemonic strategy, a counter-hegemonic intellectual world, and a counter-hegemonic set of institutions. This is what, way back in the 1970s, the French far-right thinker Dominique Venner called a Gramscianism of the right. And that's what we try to trace here and the way it has become globalized. And our argument is effectively that this Gramscianism of the right depends upon one core argument about contemporary politics, social life, and indeed globalization, which is that the world that we live in is a world dominated by managerialism. What do we mean by managerialism? Managerialism is an old idea. It comes out of the left in the 1920s and the anti-Stalinist left, but it gets really most picked up by members of the American right, such as, George, as James Burnham in the 1950s. And it's the idea that the 20th century is the century of the rule of experts, that increasingly the world is dominated by an expert class, technicians, lawyers, accountants, business executives, the Wharton School is just over on the corner there, <laughs> classic illustration of where the managerial elite comes from. 
This managerial elite has more in common across countries and cultures than it has with anything within those countries and cultures. It dominates as what the right calls a new class. And one of the crucial things in the globalization of the right is which, the way in which it has been able to draw what Gramsci called equivalences between positions across the world vis-a-vis -vis this global managerial new class. And it is this opposition to them that really provides one of the core conceptual underpinnings of the contemporary right and one of the core mobilizing devices of the contemporary right. What we try to trace in the book is the way that this intellectual understanding has been developed, but we also understand that ideas don't simply flow freely. They also rely on institutions and organizations to be propagated and produced. So the second part of the book really examines the kinds of institutions that they've tried to generate to create this counter-hegemonic project as a political reality. And I'm going to turn that over now to Rita Abrahamson to describe some of those institutions and activities. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michael. And I just want to echo the thanks to the organizers and to Professor Bob Vitalis in particular for inviting us. It is uh, very heartening to see so many come out to take the work that we've done seriously and also the project of the radical right seriously. So Michael uh, described the ideas of the radical right and the, the opposition to the new class. Uh, this has not been only a kind of um, ideological project. It has been very much what we call, drawing on Gramsci, a war of position. And Michael also mentioned how many people who write about the right talk about how important the social media sphere and the digital universe has been for their rights. One of the things we're trying to do in the book is to show how this uh, war of position has also been pursued on the more kind of traditional academic and ideological battlefield, namely in universities and in academic publishing. So we show, for example, how in the recent years, decade or so, we've seen a massive expansion of radical right-wing publishing houses. And one of the things they've done is to find old classical right-wing texts, Julius Evola, Oswald Spengler, Spengler, and so forth, and reissue them so that they become easily available to people. They've also, the English-speaking ones, have been at the forefront of uh, translating the classical French radical right, or the Nouvelle Droite, uh, so that they now become texts that are easily available on Amazon and other places uh, for the right who can only speak English or Scandinavian languages. So we've seen this massive expansion of publishing. We don't know yet. We're not claiming that they are changing the world, but we can see very clearly in these initiatives that they take ideas and the struggle, the hegemonic, counter-hegemonic struggle, very seriously. We can also see how they're trying to construct for themselves a kind of credibility, a kind of academic credibility and an academic sort of history, an ideological history for themselves that says, you know, it's not all about fascism. There is actually a project here that is seeking to say, we deserve a place at the university. And as a parallel to this, we also see, and this is familiar in one way for those of you who live in the United States, how universities have become battlefields. But it is not only that they don't like us as professors and students, it is also that they're trying to change the universities. In Europe, this has taken a slightly different route with trying to set up new universities. Uh, the forefront of this is Viktor Orban in Hungary, where we've seen at least two new universities set up explicitly to educate and train the new radical right elite. So they might be anti-elitist as long as the elite is schooled in the kind of old liberal values, but they want to create a new elite. In France, uh, Marion Marzal, who's the niece of uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, has set up her own school in Lyon, which she explicitly says dedicated to train the new ultra-conservative elite. And these various institutions and universities are networked. 
It is not one coordinated project, but they are networked and they have partnerships around the world in, in a lot of elite institutions. I do not think they have any with Penn, but I can point you to several elite institutions in the UK where they are networked into and where their students can come uh, on exchanges. Again, we're not saying that they are succeeding, but if they are succeeding, it's going to have consequences not only for domestic politics, but for world politics, which is why the last chapter in the book deals with what might the consequences be for what we have come to know as the liberal world order if this right wing, if this radical right wing project goes some way towards succeeding. There's too much um, diversity of the right to, for me to sit here and say that this is what the world would like, look like, or this is the ideal vision of the world, because there are lots of different visions. But we can point to at least three commonalities that they hold as, as um, ideal for the future world order. It would be a much more sovereignist world order. It would be a much more civilizational world order and it would be a much more multipolar world order. By sovereignist, it means that they are not, uh, the, right, the radical right is anti-globalist, but it's not anti-internationalists. So they wouldn't necessarily get rid of all of our international institutions like the EU and the United Nations, the World Trade Organizations. They would rather seek to change them from within, to make their policies more sovereignist. Already we are seeing the effects of this, for example, in the European Union. In terms of the civilizational project, what we could say is that what the radical right believes is that the world is made up of different cultures or different civilizations. And that's really the true value of the world is its civilizations, its cultures. And what global liberalism has done is to flatten and ruin all of that. So it wants and seeks a more civilizational world. Civilizations are then incommensurable, they're incompatible. But none of them are universal. None of them are superior. They're all equal but different. And this allows them to make alliances, these transversal equivalences that Michael spoke about, and allows, allows them to make alliances with people who also feel that their cultures are being destroyed or ruined by liberal universalism. So a lot of transversal alliances, for example, to peoples and cultures and states in the global south. Finally, very quickly, on multipolarity. This is not the multipolarity for those of you who study international relations of like units and a kind of balance of power. This is a multipolarity of civilizational states or civilizational regions. So we would have a world consisting of diff different cultures, different civilizations that would cooperate where it was necessary. But we wouldn't be moving towards a world where everyone would eventually come to subscribe to the same culture or the same values. We would have this very multipolar world with different civilizations. Again, you can see how this allows them, the radical right, to come up with transversal alliances with other cultures or states, oftentimes illiberal ones, that believe in multipolarity, most notably in the current world order, China and Russia. So, to finish up, we are not concluding in our book that they are succeeding in this, but we are concluding, and I will borrow from Sam here, that if we are at all concerned about the rise of the radical right, we need to understand them. We need to understand their ideological beliefs, their visions of the world. We need to know the enemy. Hi, everyone. Uh, like my colleagues and co-authors, I'd like to start with a word of thanks, uh, well, to you first for presenting our entire book uh, so efficiently <laughs> and effectively yet again. Uh, Michael and Rita have been the driving force behind, behind the project from the beginning, uh, which started as a reading group, uh, really, uh, long before Trump was a thing. Um, I want to thank the good people uh, of the Perry World House for making this event possible, and also Professor Vitalis uh, for uh, the idea uh, behind, behind this event, and I'm very happy to see it materialize. Uh, Bob, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm not going to add uh, much, uh, maybe a couple things of what's not in the book. Uh, first thing first, uh, there are no hypotheses uh, in it, regression tables uh, of any kind. 
I, I say this as a, as a U.S. Uh, trained political scientist. Uh, when I was a graduate student uh, uh, in this country, and we were studying right-wing populism, that was many, many years ago, uh, we were instructed to turn uh, questions and statements of moral outrage into research questions and hypotheses distilled from the literature. And that's a great approach. We still use it. We all love it. Uh, this is not one of those books. Uh, we, we started uh, with a different project, uh, mixing international relations theory, uh, sociology, history of ideas, political history, uh, to produce something that uh, I'm very happy to say Sam liked, uh, and, and so this is a this is a uh, this in our in our view is precisely the sort of audience we were trying to reach uh, with the book. Another thing that's absent uh, uh, from 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 the from the pages uh, is is the answer to the question what should be done, and we thought long and hard about this, uh, and like Krita was saying earlier, uh, first goal logically prior to answering that question was to try and understand what is going on. Uh, and, and much like in the spirit of Sam's uh, podcast, Know Your Enemy, uh, the emphasis is on the no part. And so I'll stop there in the interest of giving you and everyone here uh, time for questions. I didn't ask them to plug the podcast so much, <laughs> but I love it. Um, I didn't thank Bob Vitalis, and I'm, I'm, really, I'm here because uh, he invited me, and I'm really happy uh, for uh, his enthusiasm about the podcast and about this event for putting it together. Um, I'll ask my first question. Um, and Surgeon, you you referenced that this book began as a reading group, but I was interested in in more of the origins because my understanding from the book is that it began work began a proper work began on it in 2015. Is that right? Um, which is fascinating and an almost prescient feeling moment to begin a study of global reaction. Um, with the twin convulsions of Brexit and Trump coming the next year. Um, so my question is, what inspired you all to undertake uh, the pro this project in that moment? What currents were you tracking when you embarked on the book? Or maybe to put it another way, did you know something we didn't know <laughs> about how important right-wing movements were going to be on the global stage? Uh, thanks for asking. Uh, yeah, well, Michael and Rita and uh, other co-authors, they've been studying the right for a very long time. I have as well, but not this kind of right, a uh, different kind of uh, right, if, if I may say. Uh, so, but uh, f personally for me, uh, the main reason was the fact that I'm from a place called Bosnia and Herzegovina. My, my life has been perniciously affected by various forms of the radical right. Uh, and and I, I see in the audience, I'm not the only one from this country. Uh, and and uh, for us, uh, we're Cassandras. We're walking around catastrophic thoughts constantly. Uh, so 2015 was a good year as any <laughs> to, <laughs> to think about uh, to think about possible horrible outcomes that could happen uh, in this country, uh, countries that are allied to this country, such as Canada and others. Uh, one thing, I'll just plug in this one piece uh, by uh, a, a friend and a co-author, colleague of ours, uh, Alexander Hemman. He's a writer, Chicago writer uh, at Princeton now. And in February, I think 2016, he wrote a piece on Trump comparing him to one of the many or few uh, war criminals in the Yugoslav context. Uh, and he said, uh, yeah, you think you all think he's a clown, but let me show you the clowns become criminals. Uh, and this was this was a, a part of our conversation at the time as well. Uh, so I'll I'll just uh, maybe end there and give an opportunity to both Michael and Rita to contextualize this further. Uh, thank you. I mean, it's, uh, it seems like such a long time ago that it's even hard to remember. And we often say this amongst ourselves, you know, that when we started the first, you know, Trump was, was a worst case scenario. And, and we were having these conversations uh, about how similar things seem to be happening around the world. And there was, you know, Brexit referendum was on the agenda the campaign here, things were happening in different countries and as international relations people what we noted was that everyone seemed to be talking about what was happening in France, in Germany, in, I'm from Norway originally, in the Scandinavian countries, but nobody was sort of trying to say how come it all seems to be happening in similar ways in very different places and 
Ever so often we would pick up on connections of traveling and the sort of the basic networks, but ideologically we also started to look at how what most people call just populist thought seemed to be a little bit more than just populism. It seemed to be hinting at particular ideological understandings of the global. And that's when we got to what Michael was talking about in his introductory comments about uh, managerialism and the new elite. So I think that was the beginnings of, of, of the whole project, wasn't it, Michael? Yes, um, I don't want to dwell on this too long, but it, it, the other thing I think that we were feeling, and, and I think I feel it at least more intensely now than ever, is that there was also a certain exhaustion in the normal conservative world, right? What we used to call, and can still call, the normal conservative world. Um, we, we are living in the UK right now, and the normal conservative world is becoming quite a small world, actually. Um, people who used to think were quite radical now look unbelievably good by comparison. Um, so there was a certain exhaustion, intellectual exhaustion, almost institutional exhaustion amongst the right in many places. And if you look at the many studies of the right, one of the arguments is that it doesn't tend, the radical right doesn't tend to win because it defeats its adversaries. It tends to win because the people who occupy the right cease to fight it most. And that was something that, that we kind of suspected was beginning to happen and seems for better or worse, to have continued. I'm not sure if you would agree with that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a constant. I mean, I should say that our, our podcast is terribly parochial, and, we, and that's one of the reasons I'm so glad to be here talking about the global right for once. We talk about Amer really American post-war conservatism, most of all. But because of the changes that you're describing, the fact that that kind of um, fusionist consensus of the 1950s and 60s that was sort of written up in the pages of National Review and in the American context feels completely, you know, if not dead, then dying, um, and a, at least very quaint compared to um, the sort of much more populist right-wing radical right forces, to use your terminology, um, that have taken up, you know, much more space in our politics um, in the past couple decades. Um, and, maybe, and maybe this is a good place to ask this question because it might be something that people are wondering about and it's an annoying question which is the definitional question. Um, this comes up in our podcast all the time. Why do you use this term instead of that term? Uh, in the book you refer to a radical right which is distinct from mere conservatism but it's also distinct from fascism. Um, so the question is, the annoying question is, why that those terms, and, and whatever other terms you want to def define <laughs> as well, um, and, and, and how do you define it? How do you f define the radical right? <laughs> I knew it was an annoying question. Everyone wants to duck that question, <laughs> right? Um, and I cannot count the number of times that uh, we've discussed it. I cannot count the number of times we've been asked about it. I cannot count the number of times in which we said we're really not sure, but you know that it's there. Um, I mean, I think the, the crucial thing for me is if I, when I look to define the radical right as a, as a distinct form of politics, I would say that it has two main things about it. The first is that it is often if not hostile, at least suspicious of democracy. Um, populism as a move can be democratic, but it can be highly uh, ambivalent about democracy. And I think most traditional conservatives, even if they were arch elitists in a post-war sense, had made their peace with, with liberal democracy as a governmental form. I do not think the radical right uh, has done so, or indeed is very interested in doing so. The second thing I think that is really important is that traditional conservatism is literally traditional. It believes there are things of value that one needs to hang on to. On much of the contemporary right, radical right, that might be true hypothetically, but in many cases they regard contemporary society as so eroded by managerialism, so dominated by the new class, so far gone down a certain pathway that is ruinous, that in fact only a truly radical solution will work 
and indeed is realistic. And that, I think, makes them enormously different from somebody like William F. Buckley, almost unrecognizably different. It makes them incredibly different from traditional British conservatives like Mike Longshot or almost anyone else you want to hear. And you first see this, I, I suppose it's always been there on the American right, but you really first see it coming into, into play with the paleoconservatives in the mid-1970s, who are simply coming around against this kind of the fusionist consensus. So just to, to give you, I think, a good piece in the website, First Things, if anyone is, is interested in this, there's a very, very interesting uh, joint letter a number of people signed up to called Against the Dead Consensus. And it's effectively that Buckleyite fusionism may have been nice in its day, but its day is gone, and we've got to move into something radically new. I just think we should probably also say something about the other part of your question, Sam, which is the far right and the extreme right. Uh, and we, 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 are, we are fussy on that too because the distinctions here are, they shade into each other, they're not hard and fast. But for us as well, the people, the main people we're writing about are not the fascists, the street fighters, and, and, and the skinheads, and, and the people who believe that order will be overthrown by violence. This does not mean that some of the people that are there tend towards that type of politics, but the majority of them have kind of covered up their tattoos and now take their photographs in front of bookshelves. And, and, and we wanted to, to keep it at that level rather than shade into what is important but the fascist and the extremist and the violent right, which are not our main preoccupation, much as they might obviously legitimize each other. Can I plug your podcast a little bit? <laughs> so uh, we uh, sent this episode, I think two years now, uh, on, on the F word, on fascism in, in America. One of the best discussions you'll find, one of the best 1.5 hours spent on, on this uh, is the Know Your Enemy uh, <laughs> episode that you did in which you discuss everything from Robert Paxton and other historians to uh, Frederico Finkelstein's uh, use of the word semi-fascist, which also was something that President Biden used in Maryland, I think, uh, a year and plus ago, where he said, I think Trumpism is semi-fascism. And these are very productive uh, statements to think with and think uh, through, but in the book we've decided uh, we decided to use the radical right for reasons that uh, Michael and Rita outlined. So that makes sense. Um, I want to get into some of the the nitty gritty details. Um, we already you already talked about Gramsci a little bit in um, the introductory remarks, but I'd like to talk about Gramsci more uh, <laughs> because on the face of it, it's a um, counterintuitive that we would think of this. Um, Italian Marxist theorist and partisan who died in 1937 as playing such an important role for uh, cohering the ideas of all these disparate movements in different parts of the world who are on the right, not on the left. Um, you, you say in the books, you suggest in the book that like Marx with Hegel, uh, today's global right has turned Gramsci on his head. What does that mean, besides being a great phrase? Um, and why are Gramscian concepts uh, so useful, both for these moment, movements self-consciously, um, but also for painting the picture of the right that you do in the book? Well, I, it's very hard to start anywhere because there's so much uh, in Gramsci uh, that we could use to talk about the current political juncture, even that term is Gramscian. Uh, so uh, I'll just mention a couple concepts that we found very useful. So Gramsci talks about two types of wars, uh, war of movement and war of position. War of movement is basically the storming of the Bastille, which I understand uh, is sometimes reenacted even in, in Philadelphia at the Eastern, Eastern Penn, uh, right? I mean, that happens on occasion. Uh, there are other examples uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. more recently, right? Uh, that's, that's the war of movement. Uh, but uh, Gramsci's uh, contribution to thinking about uh, revolutionary action is the idea of cultural hegemony. It happens through something what he calls war of position trench warfare, war the kind that takes uh, over, uh, takes, 
t time, decades even. Uh, and it's about uh, the slow march through the institutions that include uh, institutions, uh, political institutions, but perhaps more importantly, institutions of culture, the media, arts, uh, publishing houses, uh, educational institutions, and others. And this, I think, is where we see the radical right shining uh, across, within, and between nations. And, and there's a, a unity of purpose here that I, I don't think existed ever before. And, and it is the fact that it's inspired by folks uh, in Nouvelle Droite, uh, a French new right, then, then spread uh, in Western Europe, then to Eastern Europe, in, in the United States as well. Now it's a global thing. We have in India the head of the RSS uh, using the kinds of words that are associated with the kind of right wing Gramscianist uh, march through the institutions. This is all happening within the last within the last uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, but, but the intellectual origins of this are already after 1968. Any more on Gramsci? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't need to add that much, but, but it was striking to us when we started thinking about this and then started doing some of the more empirical research to find how often right-wing intellectual in different parts of the world had already turned to Gramsci. So we found, for example, that one of the main inspiration behind Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro, was called the Gramsci, the Gramsci of Brazil. And he had his own sort of online university training people and had at least two or three ministers in Bolsonaro's government that had graduated through his program. So it was quite surprising to us, uh, having had just the intellectual and theoretical idea, then to start finding people in India, Brazil, and so forth who had already appropriated these ideas and put them into practice. And I think the other thing perhaps to highlight is that it shows really how for the radical right this, this struggle, this political struggle, is, is at the level of ideas and at the level of culture. You know, they're really aware of this as, as a, the, the culture war is a term we, we use a lot and abuse a lot, perhaps. But for them, it's also about showing that the culture must change in order for common sense to change. And only then will practical politics change. So you don't win elections at the ballot box. You win them through cultural institutions and the ways in which we think. And this is what we seem to find that the radical right is really perfected as an art. Okay. We don't have to free up no, the so we no. Yeah, yeah. Let's do let's um let's talk a little bit about another crucial concept that that it's come up a few times and, and you've sort of defined it, the global managerial thesis. Um, and that it's really, it, it seems in the book, from my reading, that it's, it's crucial for linking the worldviews of these disparate currents and providing them with a common, mutable, but common enemy. Um, and uh, there's a point in the book where you define this perspective, the managerial um, perspective, um, as th that, they s that believers in this global managerialist thesis would say that the essence of contemporary world politics is not the age-old story of realist power politics, the liberal tale of progress through institutions, or the corrosive spread of neoliberal capitalism. It is instead the rise to power of a global liberal managerial elite, the so-called new class of experts and bureaucrats. Where does this worldview come from? And you mentioned um, James Burnham and some of that kind of um, mid-century thinking. Um, but why is it so important for the right for right-wing movements in our time? And to what extent this is maybe the the more provocative part of the question? To what extent does it describe reality um, or a version of it? Um, you know, how much credence can we give to this idea that you know the world is really being run by technocratic experts, that capitalism and has gotten so complicated that really only this kind of credential technocratic elite is able to make the consequential decisions in people's, in the lives of, of nations. Um, and to what extent does, is, you know, does the right hold water in this, in this particular <laughs> respect? Why don't I, when I start off on that one. Um, one of the key, thing, key themes of any counter-hegemonic strategy is that you need to explain to the people who you're seeking to mobilize the worlds that they live in. Why is the world that you confront on a daily basis the way that it is? Why are these things that you don't like or that you feel uncomfortable about or that just make you uneasy, why are they actually happening? 
One of the crucial things that the managerial thesis does is it provides that explanation. It may sound like a form of you know, over-intellectualizing, but I think it is not. It's crucial for politics as a whole. What is equally crucial in it, I think, in the managerial thesis, is that it provides not simply an abstract sociological explanation, right? So this isn't just, oh, it's neoliberalism. I mean, you can try to mobilize people against neoliberalism, but if you look around, it hasn't been very tremendously successful, right? There were lots of nice little protests, and then they went away. When things about the right, it has staying power because it's not simply neoliberalism, it's global managerialism, and one of the crucial elements to this is that global managerialism has global managers. There is what our friend Carl Schmidt, not our friend, but our intellectual uh, interlocutor, shall we think call so. him this, yes. Uh, Carl Schmidt called an identifiable enemy, right? And one of the crucial things with politics is to be able to find that identifiable enemy because then you can show people not simply that an abstract system is doing all the things that they don't like, but an abstract people who, a system whose levers are being pulled by identifiable people. And I think that's absolutely crucial to the managerial thesis. Does anybody else want to answer whether or not we think this is empirically true? Um, empirical, I don't know if I want to say this on Zoom, but I'll say it anyway. Empirical truth and the global right is, like many politics, a rather loose relationship, shall we say. Um, but it has to be plausible enough to make it work. Counter-hegemonic strategies can't be fantasies, right? They have to connect to the world at some level. And one last thing I'll say, what's crucial here is you're not simply spoke, speaking to the so-called left behinds. Because if you look at the mobilizations of these groups, it isn't simply people who've been economically disenfranchised and lost their jobs. There are a lot of people who are doing very, very well out of the current world order who think that the radical right is a pretty good idea. Right? Because there's all kinds of other things, culturally and particularly, that irritate them or that annoy them or, in fact, that infuriate them. If I could add just a 60 second uh, footnote to that. Um, Michael mentioned in the introductory remarks that the idea of liberal managerialism comes from the left thought, right? Yeah. 1920s anti Stalinist thought. Uh, I was born and raised on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain, and for us, we had this, we had this debate as well within, within a socialist context. Uh, Milovan Jelas, the Yugoslav dissident, uh, who wrote a book in 1957 uh, called The New Class, uh, an, an analysis of, uh, of the communist system. It was exactly the same thing. You read this, you read Burnham, lots of overlaps. You read Angelo Codevilla's The Ruling Class, 2010, mm -hmm a professor who's doing our, our job, international relations. Uh, Cote Villa was a professor at the Pardee School for Global Studies at Boston University and also fellow at Claremont Institute. Wrote, wrote a book that essentially is saying the same thing. So there's a resonance uh, on the left as well, when, when you, not perhaps global uh, liberal managerialism, but certainly liberal managerialism, critique of liberal managerial societies, the states that provides those kinds of things. And, and I think that's, the, the, that partly explains uh, why it resonates in so many disparate contexts so well. Great, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even Burnham, I said Burnham, but Burnham was a Trotskyite before he was a, a conservative and a very close, you know, kind of uh, disciple of Trotsky. Um, I want to ask about the discussion in your final chapter um, about the relationship between radical right movements and what you call the liberal international order, LIO, to which they tend to be antagonistic. Um, in it, you acknowledge some of the factors we tend to rely on to explain the crisis of liberal hegemony. Things like neoliberal dislocation, the professionalization and post-political nature of party politics, and the rise of illiberal powers like Russia and China. But you add to this account in important ways. You write, quote, Wow, we agree that the hierarchical, unequal nature of the LIO is a condition of possibility of the global right. We argue that the radical right has built powerful transversal global alliances based on a logic and discourse of difference and diversity rather than claims to liberal Western superiority. 
which may sound a little counterintuitive to people who maybe have thought of the right as principally, you know, the West is the best, uh, 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 Western civilization must be defended from the hordes beyond its borders. Um, how, could you explain um, how this, the demand uh, for, quote, recognition of diversity enables the radical right's um, vision of civilization, civiliza I should say, plural, civilizations and multipolarity. Um, and if you want, because I found this part of the discussion in the book really, really fascinating, if you wanted to bring in Russia's diplomacy in Africa <laughs> in, in particular as an example, you know, once, once we explain what's going on, here's the example, that would be great. I will have the first go on that one. It's it's a big question, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it's not straightforward. It is counterintuitive, as you say. It in ver very many ways it is, and goes to the point I was making earlier about civilizationalism. There is a sort of belief in civilizations and cultures as valuable and as different, and that is not the traditional view that we. Uh, hold of the right that they are always superior. In a way, it's a very kind of um, differentialist view. We have our cultures, we are Europeans, we are this, we are whatever. You can be whatever you like, as long as you don't interfere with us, as long as you don't come here, as long as we acknowledge each other's difference. So they are what we often call differentialists and not universalists. When it comes to the, the recognition idea, is then the, this desire, the deep felt anti-Westernism, a lot of my work is on Africa. And uh, across the African continent today, we see a lot of anti-Westernism, anti-imperialism. It's always been there. It has increased massively in the last few years. The radical rights discourse here fits very well at times with this idea, we have a right to our culture, we have a right to our tradition, to our values. We do not want the West to come here and tell us what to do. Go home. And we can trace, and we do this in the book, we trace what we call transversal alliances along the civilizational differentialist line. For example, in relation to the United Nations and others' um, family policies. So, the right to gender equality, the right to, gender, uh, to gay rights, the right to uh, same-sex marriage. Those are alliances that are based, and the radical right is not necessarily driving it, but they are closely aligned with tra traditionalists and nativists in various countries in the global south. And there is here a demand for recognition, not just as a sovereign state, you know, IR, recognition, sovereignty, one vote in the United Nations. There is a demand for recognition of who you are for your culture, for your traditions. And the radical right and Russia has played this game quite effectively in various locations and in various issue areas to form alliances, to disrupt and to destabilize key elements of the so-called liberal international order. And for us, I think this is, is one of the key points in terms of thinking about how the radical right behaves and acts and has global and transnational impacts. It is not that they have to be the same. It's not that they have to agree on everything. It's not even that they have to like each other that terribly well. They can agree on their opposition to global managerialism or to imperial impositions by the liberal West. And that agreement is sufficient for them to kind of paper over other disagreements. So that's one go at that complex question. So, John, do you want to? Oh, uh, if I may, just quickly. Uh, so uh, the discourse of civilizationism emphasizes mutual respect. And that goes a long way. It has always gone a long way in places. You mentioned Russia and Africa. We're not going to talk about mercenaries in Chad. Uh, but we can talk about Russian diplomacy. The fact that uh, Lavrov, foreign minister, went to uh, Africa on a tour of sorts in July 22, 
then the Russian Duma had a Russia Africa conference the next year in which they bring folks who, who were writing books on civilizationism, pan-Africanism, all kinds of things. This should not be under underestimated, just like it should not, we should not underestimate the fact that Russia has been doing this with uh, white supremacists in the United States since the 1990s. Um, David Duke, is that the name, the KKK guy? He, I think he bought a condo in Moscow in 92, mm. right? Or what the condo was bought for him in 92. And this is, this is happening right now uh, in, in, a, in a much broader context uh, of, with, with far more reaching consequences uh, for the so-called liberal international order. The, the final thing I'll, I'll just, this is perhaps obvious, but, I'll, but I'm, I'm kind of a master of stating the obvious, so I'll do that. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> the, one of the crucial things that this allows rhetorically, this commitment to differentialism, is exactly to get away from the fascist argument of superiority, right? So traditionally, the right has always been identified with some kind of a claim of civilizational superiority, of racial superiority, of whatever kind of superiority it is. The current right, and this was really developed in France, I think, best, and it was it. You can debate how much they believe it and how much of it is tactical. Um, but it, it is a crucial part of their political rhetoric and their political appeal and their ability to legitimize themselves to say, we are not superior, right? In fact, it's the liberals who are the worst forms of global superior values these days. It's the International Criminal Court. It's the World Bank. It's all of these liberal institutions running around telling the world how to run its life. And in fact, what we are, are the people who want people to be able to run their lives the way they wish to, right? Um, my favorite line on this, I think, was this, the theorist who's the best on this is Alain de Benoit, the grand old man of the French New Right. When in an interview, he said, diversity is the treasure of the world, and liberalism is killing it, right? It's that move that I think is very, very powerful politically in global politics today, as well as in domestic politics. Okay, well we're getting close to when we would wanna go over to audience questions. And one of the things that I'm really happy about this is I usually do a podcast with like guests like this, and then I don't know what the listeners are thinking. Why aren't they saying, why aren't they answering my question? Why don't they talk about this? So this time you get to talk, and you get to ask the questions, and get to the things we haven't talked about. Um, and I think, should I ask people to line up? So if you want to ask a question, you line up over by that microphone. Um, and if, I think we should just go, go, go ahead and do the questions. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm in charge. <laughs> wow, okay, that feels good. All right, I'm in charge. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. I am curious about the concept, going back to Gramsci, uh, the concept of periphery in a world ruled by new rights. Specifically, you could think about the relationship between Trump and Bolsonaro or the relationship between Latin American new right and European new right, which still echo those colonialist mm -hmm. threats. Thank you. Oh, shall we? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, it, it is true. Uh, the way we, our genealogy of the global right starts uh, with the French new right. Uh, but this is not to say that it came from nothing. Nothing comes from nothing. I mean, these were, these were ideas infused by thought coming from a variety of thinkers uh, that were appropriated into right-wing discourses, uh, just like Gramsci was and still is. Uh, you, you would see, I mean, things such as uh, someone like Sam Francis writing a, a review of Franz Fanon's work in, I think, The Chronicles, yeah. Yeah. In, w in which Paleocon. he says, yeah, this is a great idea. You know, maybe, maybe we should all uh, strive to have a different, a different, different, a different sovereignties. Uh, and, and, you know, if this means providing Bantustans for America, I think that's the title of the, of the review. Maybe we should think about that, because here, here we see, see the kernel of, of, of a, a possible new world that's not this, you know, liberal superiority. I mean, how, how strange is that uh, from, from our perspective? 
right? I mean, this is never mentioned in any class on post-colonial theory or anything. The way that you know th these kinds of ideas have always circulated in ways that 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 simply do not confirm to our textbook understandings of Eurocentrism or, or Western centrism or any other kind of centrism. There's also, if I can say, a very interesting sort of remapping of, of geopolitical spaces within these civilizational understandings. So if you look, for example, at the Vox Party in Spain, is putting an enormous amount of energy into building uh, links, connections into what it calls an Iberosphere, right? So the whole idea of where the West begins and ends changes, right? Or what the West is, how these things work. And so you begin to get some very, very interesting different geopolitical visions operating within these, these different things. And I think this is where the civilizationalist argument actually becomes quite interestingly different. Um, the last thing I'll say, just, just to bring us back to Burnham, for this, most of you may know this, but it, it, it always fascinates me. Um, for those of you who've read uh, George Orwell's great book, 1984, and Orwell's uh, postulation of a world of three great super states, basically he took that from James Burnham, directly from his reading of Burnham, by whom he was very influenced in a, in a, largely in a negative way. But this idea of civilizational orders goes way back, and it's being reproduced in very interesting ways right now, sometimes quite not nice ways. It, it just reminded me, I should add as well, that there's a whole lot of increased interest in pan-African visions of the world at the moment, and Russia is partly involved in investing in that project as a different way of thinking order and regional orders. Your next question? Hey, Gav. Hey, good to see you. <laughs> Um, thank you all so much. Uh, during the conversation, you also talked a little bit about the uh, credit uh, of how ma the managerial class was credentialized, and I really wanted to actually ask a little bit more for the global right wing, how you all saw the institutions that helped cr to credentialize some of the global right wing actors that you're talking about. Um, so I know that you mentioned, for instance, the universities in Hungary, but I wanted to hear a little bit more in each of your work how um, these institutions help credentialize kind of um, the newest classes of these uh, right wing figures. Okay, um, it, it's a great question. It's a great question. It's a very important question. I think in the book um, and in the work, some of the work that we hope to do, <laughs> we want to trace this a lot through uh, not only universities and publishing houses and so forth, but the whole also uh, mushrooming of right-wing think tanks that uh, kind of crosses the universe of universities and the policy world and have been very instrumental in, in getting these ideas into the public domain. And I think that is something that we, we, we touch upon in the book, but also in future work we want to, to uh, invest more time in. Um, is that right? Is there something yeah. else we in the book there that we speak N we, we do, there are, you know, obviously particular institutions in particular countries uh, that have been instrumental in various places and then the links between them. So in the U.S. there are several universities, Claremont, um, Chap uh, which is the one, Hillsdale, 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 Hillsdale are the ones that we, we identify that are particularly important here. In France, uh, Marion Maréchal has been very influential in her Institute of Social Science, Economy and Policy or something like that, which has then set up a sister institution in Madrid in Spain, and they have clear links, and we can trace these links between um, the politicians and the, into the Vox party in Spain, ditto in France, and then their circulation back into Hungary with the Lodoviga and the Matthias Corvinus Institute in, 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 uh, in Hungary, which is an incredibly powerful institution. Now in 2020, they got 1.9 billion US dollars from the, the US, from the, the Hungarian government. And they have now set up a think tank in Brussels 
uh, that is funded again by, by, by the Hungarian government and linked to the Matthias Convenius uh, Collegium. Uh, and that is actively seeking to uh, put forward a uh, Hungarian perspective on EU politics. So to kind of break up the cozy Brussels bubble where everyone agrees that you know, we must have further integration of the European project, uh, they're there to disrupt it. Uh, there has been indications, for example, recently that this think tank is not only a think tank but is quite actively involved in the farmers' protests in Brussels at the moment. So I think through the think tanks, possibly more than in the sort of short term than the universities, we can trace how they get, uh, I think you used the term credentialized, but legitimized and so forth. Uh, I hope that's a beginning of an answer. I think, I think that, that sketches out the main elements. There's two things I think one that I might want to add. The first is that if you're looking to credentialize counter institutions, then of course one of the first things you've got to do is delegitimize existing institutions. And that is not easy, to put it mildly, right? But in which case your target becomes places like this, right? <laughs> Presumably, right? Mm. Liberal elite institutions which you seek to delegitimize and disempower in whatever ways you possibly can, right? So that becomes part of the cultural political struggle. The second thing is, and, and this I think the, the, Sam would probably be much better placed to comment on this than we are, you need to create an entire ecosystem, right? Not only of training people, but of when you're outside of government. Mm -hmm. You need to have think tanks for them to go into. In one of your podcasts you use this, some kind of, a, this is the right-wing employment project or this. Oh yeah, the, the, well, the right-wing wealth, the conservative welfare state. The conservative welfare state, right? For all these graduates who can't get jobs in the real world, but the think tank world is now so big and so well-funded that they can actually all make a living in it until they go out and do something else. Um, so there's a really, there's, if you actually sit back, one of the things that we think is useful about understanding this as a strategic project is a lot of it is something that we could do ourselves, right? Sit back in your chair and think, okay, how am I gonna recredentialize the world? Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? And then a number of things all of a sudden start to pop up on your radar. You think, that's weird. And then you think about it a little more and you go, you know, it's actually not that weird. It makes sense. Thanks. Thank it's you a all. great question, Thank super, super question. Yeah, so I just want to say thanks for doing like really important and timely research on a topic that is not on a lot of people's radars, I think. Um, certainly the far right, but not the transnational dimensions of it. Um, what I'm wondering is, you mentioned that the far right has staying power now, and that's somewhat surprising to a lot of people, um, myself included, just because we assume that like these parties are going to fight amongst each other, or that like once they actually do get into power, they're going to be unable to govern effectively. And frequently they are, but sometimes they're not. Um, but I'm essentially wondering is, how much staying power do they have? Like how long and protracted of a fight um, are we going to be in with the far right? And I guess also this is a question about like what does the election in the U.S. mean for this? Would Trump's victory be the death knell for the LIO, or would it be you know would his defeat be the death knell for the far right? Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is this is the big question. I mean, uh, I, I I don't think we have an answer uh, to something like this. But but uh, you you are right to ask. You know, how do we measure staying power? 20 years ago, people studied right-wing populism, far right, extreme right as well, and there was a sense of relaxation about this, right? Uh, there was a sense, uh, yes, they are powerful, they have all these new tactics and strategies, uh, the demand side explanations focused on economic uh, dislocation, uh, some focused on cultural grievances, then there's supply-based explanations, uh, provision of, of new infrastructures in, or institutional and organizational that enable this kind of politics to rise politically. But always, uh, the conclusion was, not always, but most of the time the conclusion was, our constitutions are strong in the Euro-Atlantic world, right? The best they can do is become a junior partner in some coalition government in a small European country, right? That's, that's changed, clearly, right? And all eyes are in November this year, what is going to happen. The repercussions are huge. I mean, in Canada, I think that there's no U.S. ally that has more to lose than <laughs> than Canada should should tr there sh if there is a Trump uh, 2.0 administration, uh, and and I think that's concentrating a lot of minds. The fact that we are even talking about Trump now 
tells you about that staying power. I think it's already here. I think in Europe this, this past year we saw a watershed move, a moment uh, for, for what, what you say, the far right, we call it the radical right, but it's the same thing. These parties are not going anywhere. In fact, they're probably going from strength to strength. And, and the fact that, I, I mean, this, this gets me into the what we should do, and I said we were not gonna talk about that, so I'll stop there, thank you. Maybe just a, a quick additional comment, uh, which I think you see the staying power also in the way it's, the, the radical right seemingly becoming more and more normalized. And for every election, France, Germany, which is like, whew, they didn't do quite as well as we had feared, right? But they still did an awful lot better than they did in 1990 or 1980, right? So there's that, and there's also then how the rest of the political spectrum, in order to tackle the challenge of the radical right, moves towards the right. And Michael mentioned earlier how you know the, the, the old-fashioned conservative in Britain is is like that's an endangered species at the moment, right? Because the politics is such that you're pushing the conservative further and further to the right. And I think that also has is something to do with the, the staying power here, the, how the whole political landscape is kind of shifting uh, quite radically to the, to the right. If I can say one last thing on that. One of the things you also notice when you see this shifting at national levels to the right is how many of these people globally interconnect. So just to give you a, a tiny bit of kind of real world contemporary purchase on this, for those of you who follow Brit British politics, which we kind of do right now because we're there at the moment, you know, Rishi Sunak is in all kinds of trouble as the leader of the Conservative Party in the UK. It's being pushed very, very far to the right, both by what used to be UKIP and is, is now uh, Reform UK, but also from members of his own party. The most significant of those people who are still within that party all washed up at a meeting that we were at last May in London called the National Conservatism Conference, NatCon 2023, where they rubbed shoulders with the head of the Heritage Foundation, with representatives from the Hungarian government and think tanks, with a wide variety of global right people. So on the one hand, they are trench fighters within party politics in one small state, on the other hand, they are highly conscious of being a like-minded community, even if they disagree. At least they disagree on issues that they think are important. So it's quite remarkable to see the way in which they bounce between the national and the global. And I, I would just say one thing about, about NatCon in particular, which has been held in uh, the US as well multiple times, um, and in Hungary once. Um, but that what's distinctive about it in some ways is that it is a place where this kind of um, reconciliation between the radical right um, and the more mainstream right or the dregs of the mainstream right can take place, that they can sort of be up there and that the old school right wing fusionist heritage foundation can shake hands with you know, an Orban um, you know, functionary and they can say like, look, see, we're, we're on the cutting edge too. We can see where, the, where things are going and uh, they're going right and we'll go there too. Um, and, and that's, NatCon is a really good example of the fact that there, that there, that there is this, that as, as Rita was saying, there is this polling of the spectrum to the right, uh, which causes these mainstream, formerly mainstream partisans to, um, and operatives to make common cause. <clears throat> Thank you for the, your remarks. Uh, my training is as an economist, so I believe in hypotheses and <laughs> regressions and, uh, and everything else, and, and so I have a hard time you know, thinking about the economics behind this, and, and that, that, so that's a whole other question. So, but I'd like to almost sort of localize it a little. Uh, when I think about Hungary, why hasn't Hungary, with Orban's illiberal democracy, pulled out of the European Union? And, and so, and, and spo I suppose I've got a more general question then is, why don't we see more uh, forces within the EU trying to break up the EU? If that's a, 
a, I mean, it may not be a reasonable question. As I say, my training is that of an economist. So, you know. I'll just say it, it's a super question. Unfortunately, our European specialist uh, was ill, and she's the person who couldn't be here today. So um, had things been slightly different, we would have had somebody who could have given you a very inside answer on that. Um, one of the main shifts that you see, I'll just say this, and then let Sir John pop in. Um, in the last three or four years, is a move away from hostility towards the institutions to a move towards trying to take over the institutions. And that's been very, very prominent um, with regards to the EU. All right? So if, if you take a look at the evolution of Marine Le Pen's position in France towards the EU, which was very, very much, we want to kill this thing off, to now, no, we actually don't want to do this. We want to pull it back, as Rita said earlier, to being a sovereigntist organization. So basically trade, and trade with a very, very heavy hand of national state supervision, I think. Um, so that's a really interesting trajectory going on there. And it gets us into larger arguments about you know, whether, the f whether the force of global capital will ultimately force these people into line with various forms of transnational structures, or whether or not that can be pushed away. And that's a live discussion on the right. No, these are great questions. Uh, Hungary is a true puzzle. Why, why for example, Fidesz uh, and, and uh, coalition partners of Fidesz are tolerated in ways they're tolerated by the European Union? I mean, this is part of those billions or millions of dollars that are invested in Ludovica and uh, Matthews Corvinus Institute or Collegium are coming from the European Union funds, and that's that's really, really puzzling. Um, one, one explanation is, well, let's appease this man, lest uh, they join forces with Putin and Xi Jinping, which is what they're doing anyway. Uh, the, the, I think the, the political project of Orban's government is to uh, find the find the other du jour and focus uh, the energy on on whether it's migrants, whether it's non-Hungarian minorities, whether it's the European Union, whoever. Um, but while at the same time uh, claim to protect local capital, and also uh, bring uh, Russian and Chinese capital into the country, including capital that that's building of the campus of the Fudan University in Budapest, probably not very far from uh, Nadorutsa, where Central European University was located. Uh, so, so these are these are the kinds of interesting things uh, uh, that that are happening. And the puzzle is why is the European Union uh, tolerating this? Or and and one explanation is uh, uh, well appeasement, uh, but we also have to understand that. The European Union used to be a target. Now it's a means to an end. Uh, and that end is the new geostrategic Europe or even a geostrategic Eurasia that would, uh, as a civilizational state, uh, be uh, confronting, uh, well, Oceania, to use uh, George Orwell's uh, imagery. Right? And this is where we are right now. Uh, I mean, these, these are the kinds of imaginaries that are now becoming increasingly re real uh, with people who have political power. Can we get that one last question? So th thank you very much. Uh, this has been a fascinating presentation. Um, I, as, as someone who kind of has followed uh, developments in different countries and not uh, brought that, them together, but I, I have a, a question that might bring them together. Um, so uh, Modi's India and Hindu nationalism, um, the you know, the, the use of, of religion to create a kind of mythology of a single culture in a multicultural, multi-religious country, and, um, you know, uh, sort of it is a little bit reminiscent of, of Poland in the rewriting of history and the, and the battles over history. Um, and I feel like we're seeing this in the United States currently now. So one question to you is, how do you see the, um, the, the embrace of national religion in places that didn't use, where, where that was not uh, um, a, a movement before as part of this project of the radical right? How does religion play into it? I see it. 
okay, maybe, maybe, maybe just quickly on, on, on the Modi uh, project. Uh, this is fascinating. I mentioned earlier uh, the RSS chief, uh, Mohan Bhagwat, uh, talking about the threat of wokeism and woke culture in the Indian context. This happened for the first time, I think, last year. Uh, this, is, th this is part of a larger uh, counter-hegemonic struggle, struggle against what uh, RSS and BJP perceive to be uh, 70 years of uh, Congress uh, hegemony in India. And in order to fight that hegemony, they mobilized this Hinduism as the state religion of India, Hindu Rashtra, or Bharat Rashtra being now, right? Uh, this, th th this comes as a, as a, as a struggle that's, that's, that's both borrowing but also lending ideas to uh, other, other radical rights, uh, radical right uh, movements, figures, and, and parties elsewhere, uh, mobilize the religion as a tool for maintaining oneself uh, in power. And it's been incredibly successful. Uh, I think, we, you know, when we talk about India, the largest democracy, yes it is, but it's, it's not just the largest democracy, it's also there are other, uh, all of these other political projects that are at play in addition to the democratic one. It's, a, it's another great question, and, and religion is, is obviously very important here in so many different ways. I think often, it rolls into the civilizationalism, that you know we have a Christian civilization. And it's not necessarily only the Christian religion, but it's Christianity as a culture in Europe, which then, of course, allows the portrayal of the other as the Muslim other. And there we can get into a whole lot of the exclusionary aspects that we haven't spoken much about, right? But that, that is also prominent in many of these civilizational discourses of the radical right is different articulations but 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 we often see uh, religion and Christianity um, I'll be careful now but often also expressed as Catholicism in some of these discourses and it was very when Michael and I and one of our other co-authors Jean-Francois Drolet attended the uh, NatCon conference in London in May last year there was a lot of talk about God. It surprised us how prominent religion was from so many of the speakers, uh, both in terms of going, we should all go to church more often, but also as representing um, the British culture and this, the European culture. So I think th there's, there's something very important there that, that is being mobilized uh, to, 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 to defend you know, tradition. I think we're just about out of time, so I want you to I offer one last quick thing. I want you to do that. Please. Okay, great. Uh, this is a, this this also gets to a really interesting cleavage, if we can. There are people who argue that the radical right depends on that linkage, right? And they often point to the United States. They say, look, without evangelical religion, without the American fusion of religion and politics, this project doesn't go anywhere. Um, and therefore to use the UK as an example, since Britain doesn't have that same kind of religious fervor, don't worry about it, the radical right is not gonna come here, it simply can't. This is a debate we've had with nice liberal friends of ours numerous times and journalists in the public sphere. I wish it was so, I do not believe it. And in part, this is one of the reasons that I think the managerial argument is, and the new class argument is so important, because I don't think that it is simply a fusion of nation and religion. I think there's something else that's going on here as a mobilizing capacity that should make us much, much less comfortable that if only we can deal with the state religion dynamic, we can deal with the right wing dynamic as a whole. I think there are many other resources for them to draw on, and I think they may be equally or even more powerful in different parts of the world that, that don't have that fusion. So I think it's a super, and it all comes into this incredibly complex mix that we're looking at. All right. Great. Thank you all for attending.
Thank you all for attending, and thank you, um, our esteemed guests, for that great uh, program. If you're here in person, we have food in the student lounge in the back. Uh, we have one last event before spring break coming up, so if you join us Wednesday next week at noon, we'll have an event on the second year of the war in Ukraine. We'll have three people coming to Penn from Ukraine to talk about the war from their perspective. So join me again in thanking our great uh, speakers today.